Well, I'm delighted for the very first video in our series for the new UK Cigar Scene magazine to welcome Simon Chase, who's a renowned the world over as the world's leading cigar expert. Simon, welcome. Hello, Dick. Thank you very much. And it's a privilege um, to be your first victim. <laughs> Hopefully not too much of the victim. So I wanted to start out by, by asking what it was that brought you into the cigar industry, what it was that, that started you off. Well, let me say when, first of all, it was in, I, I joined Hunters and Franco in 1977, so the end of the 70s, uh, which has been a fairly dramatic time in um, English history or British history. Um, three day weeks and, uh, you know, power cuts, and <laughs> union, um, <laughs> fun and games and, mm -hmm. uh, and all the rest of it. I spent 13 years before that in working in big advertising agencies, uh, which was a wonderful um, experience for me. Uh, I worked with some first class people, learned a huge amount about communication and advertising and promotion and stuff. Um, and I was looking for um, a change to move to the client side, right. as they say. There's always a feeling amongst people who work in agencies, be they management consultants, advertising people, PR people, that you never actually have final responsibility in the, in the advisory role that you, that you have, right. which you do get if you're working as a line manager in a, uh, in, in a company. But there was something else happening in my life at the time, and that was that I was toying with uh, doing something in politics. <laughs> and so I was about to jump into, very, at a very low level, I hasten to add, I was about to jump into, into local politics in Hammersmith and Fulham, the part of London where I lived. Right. So that was the, the time, the timing of, of uh, uh, and that was now, I mean, I, I, I can say these days that I've been in the, um, the cigar trade now for in, during five decades, and that was the first decade, which was, uh, had its own characteristics, as did the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. Mm. Excellent. And, and were you a cigar lover before you joined Hunters? Was it, were you a cigar man? I had smoked cigars. I had smoked. I hate to say I did smoke rather more cigarettes than I care to remember these days, but I haven't smoked one for a good 40 years. Mm. <laughs> and funny enough, it, they don't appeal to me. Um, at all these days, I'm delighted to report. Um, I certainly didn't know much about cigars, but one of the characteristics of the advertising trade in, in the uh, 60s and 70s was the business lunch. Right. And at the business lunch, thanks to the good auspices of Hunters and Franco, the humidor would come around at the end right. of the meal. And there I would be presented with an array of glorious looking Cuban cigars. And from time to time, uh, when somebody else could afford it, if you mm. know what I mean, um, I would take one. The, the level of my knowledge was that um, I would tend to choose a Bolivar, which I now know is one of the richest, fullest cigars, and, and not ideal for not a novice, <laughs> right. simply because he had the same first name as I did, Simon Bolivar and Simon Chase. Okay, okay. <laughs> that was your, that's, a, that's, a, that's quite a, a baptism of fire. <laughs> yes. With a Bolivar. <laughs> And so over the, over the, the, the time and your experience, this is a, a, a big question, but how, is the, how have you seen the, 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 the industry in the UK develop and, and change? Well, it's sort of shrunk. It's consolidated, if you will. Uh, when I joined Hunters and Franco, there were four separate companies competing to distribute different Havana cigar brands. Right. Um, and Hunters and Franco, in point of fact, had a you know, comparatively small portfolio consisting of Monte Cristo, H. Upman, Ramon Leones. We had Davidoff, which we ran through a separate company, which I spent uh, three or four years managing. Um, uh, and then ultimately we had Cohiba, but that was, when you think of the, the 23, 24 brands <laughs> that we distribute now in the United Kingdom, it was a very small proportion of all of them. Jolly nice brands, Mark you. But Against us, we had companies, Knight Brothers, Melbourne Heart, um, Joseph Samuel, uh, who were selling um, uh, Bolivar, Joseph Samuel, Punch and Hoya de Monterey at Melbourne Heart and Romeo Juliet at, at, uh, at Knight Brothers. So big brands against us. It was a very, very different world to right. that which we, we, we have today. And from, a, from a, a marketing perspective too, I suspect things have changed fairly substantially in the, uh, over, your, over your years. Well, the, 
often say this, that I, I was the first marketing person that any of the, the companies operating in, um, in, in the Havana cigar trade had ever hired. Why? <laughs> well, you have to know a little bit of history to, to understand um, the, 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 the answer to that question. And what had happened in, from, from the start of the Second World War in 1939, the government almost immediately put on complete dollar controls um, in order to divert every single uh, con convertible piece of sterling into, into, into uh, materials for the, for the war, which did not unfortunately include cigars from Havana, despite right. the predilection of the Prime Minister of the from time. 1940 yep. onwards. Um, <laughs> But um, so total dollar controls, no importation at all of Cuban cigars into the United Kingdom from December 1939. And those restrictions were total, not just during the period of the Second World War, but through until the end of 1952. Goodness me. Um, but even then, and this is what, what really shocked me when I first heard it, was that the dollar controls were then gradually lifted. I mean, you, you had to apply. There was a license granted every year for so many dollars, which was apportioned between the importers based on the number of cigars they had imported in 1937, 8 and 9. Right. So there was a strict formula as to how much money you would have to buy Havana cigars in your brands. And that lasted up until 1972. Goodness me. So, I mean, it's, 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 you, you forget. I mean, these are people of my, my age remember when you were only allowed to take 50 pounds on holiday. Yes, yeah, yes. And you could, uh, but you, you, you had an advantage if you went to places in the Stirling area. So for example, Malta, Super Island was incredibly popular. Yes. But going to Greece, going to uh, Spain, going to the south of France was a, was a different kettle of fish. Mm. Uh, so you know, it was a very different world uh, as you enter into the, the during the 60s and, and into the 70s. Right. But there had been no requirement for anybody to, to market uh, Havana cigars because to all intents and purposes, you just distributed what you could what get. You got, right, uh, right. So uh, it was Nick Freeman, you know, who headed Hunters and Franco at that stage, had, do, had done since uh, the early 60s, um, who decided that, that a marketing person might, might help in terms of uh, developing what was then uh, a, freer, a freer market. And that's the, yeah, so the product becomes more freely available, get out and, uh, and, and sell more. And there's obviously the, the issue of the, the, uh, the embargo, but the industry in, in Cuba has changed hugely, I suspect, in, in, your, in your time. Again, think of the history uh, a, a bit. Um, and, you know, the big event in Cuba, um, still, in many ways, was mm. the uh, Castro's revolution, in, in which I mean, he, he came to power in, in January 1959, although he didn't uh, change things in the economy in Cuba until 6061, mm. uh, when the whole of the cigar industry, the fields and the factories was, 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 was nationalized. Um, and, uh, but, but nevertheless, the, 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 there was then, we were in the, the height of the Cold War. <laughs> so it was a very different Cuba to the Cuba that you, you visit yeah. t t t today. Um, um, I mean, certainly, I, mean, I can tell you some stories about how um, how different it, it was. I mean, you, 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 you literally would not believe how, 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 uh, how much that, that aspect of things has, has changed. It was a completely closed shop. I mean, for example, I, I used to be called in in London by MI5, or was it MI6? I was never quite sure, because they wanted to know about the people um, that I knew in the Cuban embassy. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, yeah. I mean, there was, yeah. I used to get these Ministry of Defence um, letters, you know, very embossed letters, and you know, would you like to come and see us at, at, at Admiralty Arch? I remember going, right. going there. We had to requisition a bottle of some of the filthiest wine I've ever drunk if I wanted to have a drink with, with, with a sandwich that I was having with this gentleman, you know, who was from, from sort of one of James Bond's chums. Wow. Wow. <laughs> um, so, but I mean, I had no idea what they wanted to see me for. They wouldn't tell me but when it when it came out. It was they wanted to, to, to inquire about what uh, who I knew and. I think they'd heard my, they were, they were monitoring what happened at the Cuban Embassy and my name had come up, you know, as somebody that was wow. being talked about. Right. Um, I mean, oh God, <laughs> that, 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 that was just after I became a councillor. I never forget that, that um, the chap asked me, well, you know, if, if, if you didn't know what you were being invited here for, what did you think you were being 
if you weren't sure it was Cuba, what did, did you know? What did you think? Yes. You I thought maybe you wanted to know about whether I felt any of my my the, the Labour opposition in Hammersmith and Fulham were dangerous, <laughs> <laughs> were dangerous but, Marxists. But, right. But no, is it, uh, he uh, said, "Are they?" <laughs> 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 it was. It was. I mean, when I say a different world, yes. it was a different world. I could. But in principle, it, I mean, that that coloured a lot of things. I mean, it was. It was Cuba was much more closed. Right. Um, I mean, you went there, and it, you know there were no tourists. Um, you were monitored in wherever you went. Um, uh, you were only allowed to go to certain places. You couldn't take photographs in in a lot of the areas because there were military installations and, and, and so on. So, right. uh, and indeed, you just no explanation was ever given as to why you couldn't visit the plantations, but you just didn't go. Yeah. You know, it was uh, the, all of those things were were happening. So it was a completely different world. So. Uh, and to, I should imagine the, the hotels and the food were a little different to the way they are today. Uh, yes. Um, I mean, the charm, I remember the first hotel I stayed in, which I, it, I, it's a spectacular building, love it to this day, the, the Riviera Hotel. I don't know if you've been I do, I've been, been around it, yes. In those days, um, they hadn't washed the windows for 25 years, <laughs> which showed. Yes. <laughs> and there was a custom, which I think may still apply, where if anybody got married in the provinces in Cuba, they were allowed to come to Havana for their honeymoon and put up in a, in a swanky hotel. So right. the net result was all of the furniture after 20 years had cigarette burns on it. Oh, and there were things like there was a sort of bare wire running through the shower and stuff like that. So, you know, it, was, it was quite a challenge. But um, the, the, If you go around the inside of the Riviera today, I don't think a huge amount has changed. If you go into the, uh, I think it's the Copa Room, it's called. The, yes. The big, which well, used to be the casino with the big uh, egg dome over it. That's I swear you, you can still sort of hear the 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 the, uh, the hiss of of sort of shiny shiny suits of, uh, of men walking around there from the fifties and the sixties back in the day. It's, it hasn't the, the, internally it hasn't changed. There was changed. a steam room on the top floor, and, and you used to wander up there, which was magnificent. And you knew George Raft was in there somewhere, but you never met him. <laughs> <it. laughs> it's just a, yeah, it's tucked away in a corner somewhere. Uh, it's a leftover from. But but it was a very very different world, and, and um, um, you know it's it's uh, it's amazing thinking back, and, and really the, the 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 change, I mean not only the change in terms of the political setup, which happened mm. to be you know, 89, 90, and the start of the awful special period in in, in, in Cuba, but that that really provoked a, a complete change in the whole way that the industry was run. Um, and so really that 1990, which happened to be our 200th anniversary that year, and we had all the, uh, the, the world cigar folk, both the sort of American people who operated in America and, and all over Europe and, and, um, um, and here, to a great party at the uh, Hyde Park Hotel. Um, one of the first big cigar, it was I think actually almost certainly the first big cigar dinner. Um, little did we know at that stage that we were on the cusp of the cigar boom <laughs> and everything else that's happened in the, the past 25 years in a world where Cuba is a, is a completely different place. So through all the, through all the changes of, uh, the thing that, through all the changes in the UK and through all the changes in Cuba, the thing that's extraordinary is that the industry, I suspect in the way that the, the cigars are made, in Cuba has just continued on through that. that doesn't, uh, when you go into the factories, it appears to be the same as, as it ever was. I, the, the, there are tiny changes that take place to the production process, but they are tiny. And I must admit, I tend to notice them more than my friends in Havana <laughs> say in Cuba do. Right. It's, it, it's what I call the Westminster Abbey syndrome, as you know. <laughs> I, I mean, if I go to Westminster Abbey, I just sort of say, well, there it is, take a look at it. <laughs> You know, whereas a, a, somebody who doesn't go there often a foreigner will notice everything in there. You know what yes, I mean? yes. But, uh, so there are there have been over the years a number of detailed changes. Yeah, I mean, in in recent years, but nothing nothing significant. I mean, you you still I have a a piece written in 1883 order. It is in a small one of those little compendium books on tobacco, describing the process, and it really is completely the same as as uh, today as it was you know, well over 100 years ago, 125, 30 years ago. So uh, it, and that's it is timeless. that's extraordinary. When, when, you, when you see it uh, and you see the, uh, the, the way the, the, the tobacco is processed and the way the, the factories are, you get the impression that everything is pretty much the same. But uh, it's, 
interesting to, to, to discover it, that it's the same. But then the, the, the big change, I suppose, has been, in fact, you're sitting smoking at a Churchill and we we're just briefly talking about that, has been the change in the, in the cigar sizes and the demands of, uh, of, of the industry or, or of, of smokers over that time. Let me see if I can illustrate that um, with a couple of cutters. First of all, hunt the cutter is the problem. <laughs> Oh yes. Now, here is a fairly normal. I mean, it, this is not even the biggest. I mean, there was uh, Edward Zahakian showed me the other day a 70 ring gauge cutter. This will happily manage a 56, 57. Yep. Uh, but that is the normal size of, of of a cutter these days, and anything less is is going to give you problems with some of the with some of the larger. Uh, yes. During the 1970s, when I joined the industry, the 1980s, and into the start of yep. that was all you needed. That would. <laughs> <laughs> that would do you. Yes, yes. So uh, that cuts. That is one of the best cutters ever made. Um, it's it's perfect. I mean, it lasts. I mean, this this was dates from mid eighties. I think, um, uh, and it's, it's it's still absolutely razor sharp and cuts any forty two ring gauge cigar <laughs> <laughs> immaculately. Oh, yes. Um, but you know, forty two ring gauge was was what it was. And Somewhat. Coronas, yes. Biddy Coronas, Lonsdales. That was the market. Yes. There were yeah. these dangerous new cigars which were, had appeared probably in the 60s sometime called the Robusto Size, which we didn't have the word until 1989, right. um, which were 50 ring gauge. And, and, but, you know, they weren't popular. I, I've often tried to find a, an example, to, to, a way of explaining to people just how things have changed. And in fact, my friend Ana Lopez came up with uh, something the other day which even shook me and shook, shaken everybody that I mentioned it to. In the mid 80s, Anna, when she first joined Cuba Tobacco, which is the forebear of, of, of Habanos SA, uh, was responsible with liaison between Cuba Tobacco and, and the Particus factory. And she remembers going to the factory and going through the annual production schedule for, um, uh, for, for Particus sizes. And in amongst that, there was the Series D number four, which, as everybody knows, is a robusto size, by four and seven eighths, or 124 millimeters, by 50 ring gauge. And she remembers the global order in a whole 12-month period for that being, guess, how many cigars globally, Series well, D number D4. four, for the whole world in the mid 80s. Well, it must have been two or three million in the millions of sticks? 5,000. 5,000? 5, 5,000 cigars. For what is today the, the most popular Which is now, in, in, I think in it is UK. now, it is number one. It's the number one selling size, overtaken the Monte Cristo number four, uh, the Mareva size. That's extraordinary. Um, and, and there were only two customers. And that was the UK and Switzerland. And, and, and nobody else had, had, <laughs> had caught on. You ask me how the world, how the, the trade has changed, yes, you cannot begin to understand no, how different it is now. And the size example, of course, is, uh, is, is just you know, one of the more recent manifestations. Yes, I mean, that's amazing. People didn't like cigars of that size. They were available. You know, we had at, at Hunter's, we had Ramalione's, we had the specially selected. That was our only Robusto. Uh -huh. um, uh, the Epicure appeared around that time. I did actually find a date for that the other day, but um, but you know they, they, they just weren't popular, uh, mm. and that was only 50 ring gauge, and we're now we're, we're eagerly waiting for the first 58. Yes, Parejo straight sided cigar from yeah. Cuba in, in the form of the Robusto Supremo the, Cohiba. The Cohiba. Yes, limited edition 2014. Will it make it in 2014? <laughs> <laughs> don't hold Watch your this space. don't hold your breath. <laughs> One, so four. no, it's, it's um, size is just one aspect of, uh, of um, what has changed out of all measure. Yeah. Although sometimes, funnily enough, of course things go back to sizes which were popular. And, and one of the things where I did have, I mean, it was, it was something that I told the history of to, to Cuban colleagues in the mid, oh, it was about 2006, I gave this talk um, on, on the development of sizes over the years, because I had a lot of information on, on you know, exactly when the, the double everything. figurado, the, the perfecto, if you will, size, which used to dominate. I mean, in the 1890s, everything was a perfecto. By the mid-1930s, virtually, they were grandfather's cigars, still a few of them around, but they'd, 
uh, basically they'd gone. But mm. the, then there was this little cigar, uh, which made its its um, first appearance in around the early 1900s. 1907 is the, the date which uh, has been said to me, which was the 90 millimeter La Corona, half a Corona, they called it. Right. Uh, and that was uh, and that was actually the biggest selling. Cuban cigar in the United Kingdom by miles mm. in before the First World War, during the First World War. I mean, colossal because Sir John French, not that he was a great, great general, but he knew a good cigar. Yep. <laughs> um, and um, latterly in the, in, the, in the 20s and 30s, that, that was what everybody was, was buying. Millions and millions on them. And every brand eventually had to make a, a half Corona or a half a Corona. Right. And so in 2000 and whenever it was after, it was about four years after I gave the speech, pointing up that I felt this was something which, given smoking bans and limited options, the time that you have to smoke, this was something which should make a comeback. So right. we have the H. Upman um, uh, half a Corona. Yes. And I'm told there might be something of a similar dimensions coming from Monte Cristo next year. But Wonderful. Oh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a scoop. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, you've just reminded me of a lovely story that I remember you telling me before, and I would be delighted if you tell again, about your trips to Cuba and the, at the times when the Particus and the Upman factory were one behind the other, and the, 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 uh, the trip between the two wasn't necessarily as easy as it could have been. It was not allowed at all, uh, because we, we, you know, hunters, uh, hunters in Franco, we, we're known as hunters over there as well, um, was the, the Monte Cristo and Upman company. Yep. So H. Upman fa factory, we were made welcome, no problem at all. Um, abutting that, uh, you know, back to back, was, yes. was, 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 was Particus. And there was a door leading between the two. And there, <laughs> there they were making the Ramon and Special Sector, which we imported, but they made <laughs> not many more, but they had Series D number four as well in modest quantities. <laughs> and um, um, so, um, you know, I was desperate to get in to see Particus as well. Why not? But no, absolutely not allowed. You know, that the, I mean, in those days, I'm talking the early 80s now, that, you know, that was a Samuels brand and Hunters and Franco was, could not be allowed to see a Samuels brand. Just I remember see. on that occasion, we were allowed to go into, um, into El Laguito um, because uh, we had been appointed the Cohiba um, agent our exclusive distributor mm. um, but we hadn't seen any cigars yeah uh, but we were allowed to go there and of course that was where that was known as the Davidoff factory I mean because that's oh. where the Davidoff number one two and ambassadrice uh, were made in those days in, in point of fact Davidoff yeah. <laughs> when I was general manager of, of the Anglo Havana cigar company which was the company distributing Davidoff the, the guys in Basel gave me a picture of El Leguito saying this is our factory. <laughs> okay, uh -huh. I didn't know any better. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I did a little bit after I'd been to um, to El Aguita. Right. So, How uh, fascinating! That's a piece of his history I didn't know at all. That's lovely. That's the thing. Talking to you, Simon, we could sit here for absolutely hours, and there's there's every every uh, every, every question begs another four or five. I, one day so I must. I mean, regardless of the, the, the history that I'm planning to write for for, for the 225th anniversary of. Of, uh, of of Hunters and Franco, which is getting good, pretty sort of, uh, which is pressing coming up. <laughs> yep. Uh, at the moment, um, I also want to try and write down things like that because uh, you know, it, people seem to be interested, and and and, and you know, it is part of the history. I mean, yes, you went there in those days, and this is what you saw. Yeah. You were in Alaguito, and they were making, uh, well, they were making Cohe they were making the Lancero side, the Alaguito number one. Mm -hmm as the Davidoff number one, that was their biggest seller, the Monte Cristo Especial uh, and the Cohiba Lancero, and indeed, of course, in those days, the diplomatic um, Trinidad. Right. Um, although even that was kept secret from us. It was Cigar Aficionado who first discovered the, uh, the Trinidad. Uh. Well, that, yeah, that, 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 that's, that's fantastic. I mean, it is extraordinary how, how it's developed and how it's come on. And then we come on, you mentioned it very briefly, Next year, the, 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 the 225th anniversary of, uh, of Hunters and Frankau, and, yes. uh, and some very special things happening in that year, including, I believe, word has it, a, a rather interesting cigar. Mm. Well, what we wanted to do was to have a, a product which was special. Um, 
uh, and a party, <laughs> which hopefully will also be special. <laughs> now, the party won't take place until June. Right. Uh, I think it's going to be June the 19th. Um, and um, so everything, you know, the, yes, there will be some dribs and drabs of stuff about the uh, 225 years. Right. Uh, but the, 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 the main events so the main event is, is the, the peak June. of the, the height of the smoking season, as we, yep. as we have these days. Um, but just to, to mark such a sort of lengthy um, period, we, we thought we'd try and do, to, to recreate quite a lot of aspects of stuff from the past. Right. Um, in 2000, we'd, we'd um, used H. Upman as the brand as our celebratory vehicle, so to mm -hmm. speak. Well, this time we, uh, and the, the reason we chose H. Upman was because for, for a period, Jay Franco, part of Hunters and Franco, owned the Upman factory and the right. brand worldwide. That was between 1922 to, tw well, it actually was 25 when they got, finally got control, uh, up until 1937. Right. Uh, but prior to that, in, in 1911, um, the Hunters Company had bought Ramalionis. Oh, okay. Um, I know that. Which they sold to Cifuentes in 1927. Uh -huh. So, Ramalionis was our, Has that our chosen brand. History, yeah. Um, very kindly, uh, Habanos were, were happy to, to, uh, to make a Vitola, which was unique mm -hmm. <laughs> and similar to the shapes that were sold during the period that we owned the brand. So, t typically in the 1920s, you would find cigars. They'd actually usually be smaller than this, but with this rather this odd head, almost like a uh, a torpedo, almost like a, a pyramid, but right. but just but not quite pointed, and that was that's called a, a cabeza tumbada or dropped head. <laughs> huh. And in fact, most brands were made with dropped heads right up until the 50s. Some some after the revolution as well, you'll find cigars with that sort of a shaped right. head on them. Okay. Um, so it was an old an old style. Yes. The, the dimensions are the same as a gordito, so it's five and a half, 141, I think it is, by 50 ring gauge. Nothing too massive because, yes. you know, <laughs> we're, not, we're not going for biggest ever. No. Um, but we thought we'd, we'd add something to this by, by ensuring that the cigars were made and shipped to the UK two years before we put any on, on sale. So they were made in 2013 in Havana and shipped to the UK and they've been sitting at an unknown address, <laughs> somewhere in the south of England. Right. <laughs> um, ever since then, so so they they are being pre-aged. Right. Before they're released onto the market, none of this fresh as daisy stuff. These are pre-aged cigars. Wow. These uh, come in a in a slide lid box of um, uh, of, of twenty five. Right. Silk ribbon. They've got a special band on them. Hunters and Franco, uh, seventeen ninety twenty. 15 Anniversario 225, so they're known as the Anniversario uh, 225. Um, and as you probably know, the slide lid box, like the Epicure comes in, that sort of thing, isn't, has been known as cabinet selection. Right. And has been a, but actually that word is now being taken off all the boxes by, by Cuba because its real meaning <laughs> was something completely, people thought that must refer to that type of box. Uh -huh. No. <laughs> oh. Um, it refers actually to the fact that it, but up until the Second World War, you could buy any size in boxes like that, but which would be delivered to a customer in a huge cedar cabinet ah. containing 100, 200, 500, 1,000, up to 12. In one case, Dunhill had a 35,000 cigar cabinet piece of furniture. A 35,000 5, cigar cabinet. Okay. Um, that, and it that was that cabinet, and, and these were cigars selected for cabinets. Right. And they happened Rather to put them in those boxes as, I a, see. as a shipment um, yep. a, a, advantage. So what we have done is to have 225 cabinets, which are replicas, if you will, of the sort of cabinet that was, was made in those days uh -huh. in cedar, beautifully made in Europe, uh, in Italy, in point of fact. Um, and we'll have 225 of those numbered, each containing four boxes, so 100 cigars. Ah, right. There will also, this cigar will also be available in its normal boxes. For, right. For right. refills or alternatively, yes. just, you know, if you, because it's going to be fairly heavy on the handbag, I think it's the, yeah. <laughs> the 225. Will, yes, yes. Uh, will, will go quite quickly. But so we're, we're revisiting quite a lot of the tradition. So many traditions. The tradition in the size, yep. the tradition uh, in the aging, and the tradition in the presentation of the, Wonderful. Uh, of the, of the cabinet. Wonderful.